dieting. The definition of dieting is to restrict oneself to small amounts or special kinds of food in order to lose weight. With a definition this broad, it stands to reason that a diet can mean a lot of different things to different people. For some, it can be as simple as avoiding foods which they define as junk foods. For others, they may choose specific food items to cut out. The problem with diets like this is they are imprecise and based more on conjecture than on science and reason. These issues of imprecision and confusion gave rise to the popularity of a new type of diet, the IIFYM diet. IIFYM stands for If It Fits Your Macros. This diet does away with the sweeping generalizations and imprecision of many fad diets of the past. Macros stands for macronutrients. Macronutrients are the three main compounds that foods are made up of. Once digested, these macronutrients are sent to your cells, like the ones in your muscles, where, although the cells do it in different ways for each type of macronutrient, they turn the macronutrients into energy, which we measure as calories. The IIFYM diet is based on the idea that, since body fat is simply excess stored energy, to lose fat, all you need to do is give your body a reason to tap into it. People who follow the IIFYM diet will calculate how many calories their body burns in a day and then eat less than that amount. This creates what is called a deficit and forces your body to tap into some of that stored energy, fat, to make up the difference. The way they control their calories is by looking not at specific foods, but at what they are made of. The three macronutrients are proteins, fats, and carbs. The cells of the body have different systems to make energy out of these different macronutrients. But because we know how many calories can be made from these different macronutrients, then calculating how many calories you are getting in a day and hitting that deficit becomes as simple as reading the labels and watching the pounds shed off. There is a problem though. Eating food which yields less calories than your cells need day after day can begin to take a toll on people. Remember how I mentioned that the body has different systems for making energy from different macronutrients? Well, when you're eating below your baseline, your body is constantly switching between these systems. With all of them running low on fuel, your body is trying to figure out which one to use based on your last meal. In your body, cells need energy in a specific form called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. All these macronutrients can be turned into ATP, as I said, but remember, there are different systems used to do this for each of these. Think of most cells in your body as having three power plants next door to each other. They burn different fuels, but they all output electricity, or in your body's case, ATP energy. Here's the thing though, just like diets, not all of them are created equally. Your cells have a favorite fuel, a fuel which delivers the most energy, fastest, and with the least effort. This system is called glycolysis. It burns sugars, aka carbohydrates, specifically in the form of glucose. This system is capable of delivering huge amounts of power on demand and its byproducts can be used by the other two generation systems. Sounds pretty good, right? Your body agrees. While this star system, glycolysis, can burn only glucose, the other two systems are more versatile. They can burn either byproducts from glycolysis, or in the case of the Krebs cycle, it can burn the acetyl-CoA, which your body derives from breaking down fat. If you sprint a quick 60 yard dash, a lot of that power is thanks to glycolysis and its carbohydrate fuel. When you are feeding yourself well, there are no problems. All three systems run smoothly, but we aren't talking about being fed well. We are talking about diets and that's the issue. When you're eating at a deficit, things get thrown out of whack. Glycolysis keeps trying to turn on, runs for a while, and then runs out of sugar and your body switches to favoring the other systems for a bit, back, forth, this switching can feel like a roller coaster. Blood sugar rises, falls, the body's in a state of stress, your mood may swing. All the while, your body is constantly trying to predict which fuel it will have to send to your cells next. Your body reacts to this chaos the best way it knows how, by sending powerful hunger signals to you, hoping this will increase the available fuel. So if part of the problem is that your body keeps trying to use glycolysis, what would happen then if we just stopped sending any carb fuel? This is the basis behind the ketogenic diet. When you stop eating sufficient carbohydrates, but you still eat sufficient fats, 
your body switches to the Krebs cycle and the burning of fat as its primary source of cellular energy. Let's run through an example of exactly what happens when you stop eating carbs. We already know the body always prefers sending cells fuels compatible with glycolysis, but the lengths it will go to to keep this up is pretty incredible. Your liver plays a big part in all of this. Reason being, the liver converts the nutrients in our diets into substances that the body can use, stores these substances, and supplies cells with them when they're needed. When you eat carbs, your liver makes glucose from them and sends it to other cells through your blood. Cells, including cells like your muscles, can only store a limited amount. So, if you don't eat carbs for a few hours and do some activity, that should be enough to shut down glycolysis, right? Well, not really. Because the liver knows it can't rely on you to eat carbs every few hours, this entire time it's been stockpiling something. Liver cells have those three power systems just like any other cells. While well, these liver cells have been breaking down fatty acids into acetyl-CoA to run the Krebs cycle, they have been taking much of the ATP they get from this and putting glucose through a process with it to form glycogen. Glycogen is really just a more complex sugar which stores better. Unlike glucose, it is a polysaccharide, making it more stable than glucose, the monosaccharide. Your liver can hold up to 100 grams of glycogen, and it now begins breaking it back into glucose to send to your cells, like your muscles, to keep things running smoothly. This stable sugar store is why even if you intermittent fast and don't eat in the morning and work out in the afternoon, you can still have a great workout. Depletion of liver glycogen occurs over a period of 12 to 24 hours, though this varies greatly with activity levels. So what about once that runs out? Well, this is where things get really interesting. Remember how I mentioned the liver engages in the Krebs cycle, breaking down fat into acetyl-CoA to produce ATP, and then using that spare ATP along with glucose to make glycogen? Well, since there is no glucose to use to make glycogen, your liver decides to switch tactics. There is an intermediate compound in the Krebs cycle called oxaloacetate. This can actually be broken down into glucose, a process known as gluconeogenesis, in this way, your liver can actually create a small amount of glucose out of this non-carbohydrate substrate. But since this interrupts the Krebs cycle, the acetyl-CoA, which it makes from fatty acids and feeds into the now broken Krebs cycle, begins piling up. Think of the breakdown of fat in your liver like deliveries of fuel to the Krebs cycle power plants in the liver. But the workers in the power plant realize that the fuel they are running their air conditioning with could, with a few tweaks that can only be made in the liver, be better used by cells elsewhere in the body which can only burn that fuel. So, like a good neighbor, they hamper their own factory to send this fuel to people who need it. Now their fuel deliveries are piling up. So what should the liver do? Because of its unique enzymes, the liver is the only place that can make glucose out of oxaloacetate. So it doesn't want to stop doing that. A small number of other unique cells in the body which lack everything but the glycolysis system are dependent on this trickle of glucose. But at the same time, the acetyl-CoA is building up. So, what does it do? Well, remember a lot of cells in the body, including muscle cells, contain the Krebs cycle energy system themselves. They can break down acetyl-CoA into energy. And unlike the liver, their Krebs cycle is still perfectly functioning. So the liver does something incredibly smart. It breaks the acetyl-CoA into smaller compounds called ketone bodies and ships them through the blood to those cells who, in turn, turn it back into acetyl-CoA and use it to make their own energy through the Krebs cycle for themselves. Since the liver is only sending a very small amount of glucose out, the second system, the Krebs cycle, and the third system, the electron transport chains, are essentially powering most of your muscle functions across your body. And they are running on fuel derived from fatty acids, including those ketone bodies which are being shipped up from the liver. Once the body gets used to this after a few days, it stops expecting carbs and glucose. Amazingly, Eating this way, people report feeling less hungry when eating at a deficit. This is what is interesting about the keto diet. You're fundamentally changing the way your cells generate energy. When ketone bodies in the blood reach this amount, you're medically in the state known as ketosis. So how does this help you lose weight? Well, there are two primary benefits. First of all, it does seem that eating a high-fat, low-carb, ketogenic diet, at least based on some very respected metabolic ward studies, does slightly raise your basal metabolic rate. In other words, the calories your body naturally burns in a day on its own does go up slightly. 
In a recent study conducted on 17 obese men, switching to a ketogenic-based diet resulted in an average of 88 additional calories burned per day, compared to the baseline diet, although this did start to fall as the study progressed, so I wouldn't say this is the primary benefit. Perhaps the larger benefit, though, is that participants consistently report feeling less hungry, so it is easier for them to stick to these diets because they are less tempted to overeat. This is why, in another study conducted by several doctors, they found that ketogenic diets have a greater participant retention, and thus, the keto group lost more weight. Statistically, you are likely to last longer on a ketogenic diet before just throwing in the towel. Of course, there are also some drawbacks. In a previous video I made, I break down total power output available over time during an activity. The purple colored zone, which encompasses the duration of activity between approximately 10 and 120 seconds, that is glycolysis. You're seriously hampering this energy generation system. But because you will always have some glucose, it is never truly shut down. Just how much it is hampered is tough to say. The body of research is fairly mixed. It seems as though while intensity may suffer in short burst activities, ketosis adapted endurance athletes may actually see improvements in time to fatigue. If there's one thing the human body is incredibly good at, it is adaptation. Also, ketosis reduces insulin levels, and insulin is well known to suppress proteolysis which is the breakdown of proteins into smaller peptides. This coincides with the metabolic ward study I mentioned. In it, subjects saw a greater loss of lean mass when following the ketogenic diet. This makes sense considering these amino acids can be used during gluconeogenesis, which we know the body does do during ketosis to produce that small amount of glucose we talked about. So overall, this diet has its pros and cons. I will say though, Doing the research for this one, I found it to be a very contested topic, with both sides feeling very strongly. I think the point that a lot of people who champion the keto diet want others to understand is this diet isn't meant to be a magical formula that will cause pounds to just drop off. Instead, it's a tool, which when used correctly can help manage food cravings and make the dieting process easier. We can all agree though, if you want to lose excess body fat, whether you're eating keto or not, it all comes down to eating an amount of food which contains less calories than you burn in a day. I hope you enjoyed this longer format video. If you did, consider subscribing. And as always, until next time, D-Man signing off.